Hey, uh, what's up everybody? My name is Adam. I'm the campus pastor out at our West Campus. So glad that you jumped in online with us today. We're in the middle of this series called Never Alone, where we're taking a look at the idea that God is like with us in everyday life and he's like right here like a best friend, but in like the most non-creepy way possible. If you have any questions or if we can help you out with anything, uh, you can hit us up on social media or uh, we've got a form online. We'd love to be able to, to answer any questions you have or help you take a next step to get connected around here. Thanks for joining us. So, so God, um, so we just sing a song or heard a song, and maybe we hear it all the time or maybe it's the first time, but something inside of us says, that's what I want to know. Is everything going to be all right? Because a lot of us are stressed out. A lot of us got stuff going on in our life, and we don't know how it turns out. And so we came in here looking for something, some answers maybe, uh, uh, some hope. And so we're going to ask you, Lord, to do what you do every week uh, in this place is will you teach us about your son Jesus and then put Jesus right beside our real everyday life and see how life could actually be better if we put our lives and Jesus in the same, in the same place. So just teach us about Jesus. It's in his name I pray, amen. Hey, if you haven't been around uh, this summer, we, uh, we're, we're in week four of a six-part series. We've got a couple weeks after this. Where we're kind of unpacking this idea of, uh, of living our life never alone. Like this idea that, that Jesus is actually right here with us uh, in this life, that heaven is not this place that we wait for later after we die someplace else, but that Jesus actually wants to live this life with us. And, and the phrase that we're kind of been, been unpacking, which is kind of new for a lot of us, is this idea of living in a conversational relationship with God. And that, that's, just, that's just different for a lot of us. I mean, a lot of us have grown up with some version of God in our lives where we pray at him or we talk to him when we need stuff from him. But, but this whole idea of living with him all the time and, and, and not just talking to him, but to, to actually be able to tell other people, I'm hearing from God without them thinking you're crazy. That's just kind of a, kind of a new idea. And it's a paradigm shift from a lot of the ways that we have thought about God and us like, like getting along together or being in a relationship together. And so, so probably, um, and you've heard me use this phrase a lot over the last several weeks and you can hear it, it's really the direction our church is, is really going, but this umbrella phrase about the, the things that have to change in our life, we're calling it spiritual formation. And here's what we try to do week after week in here if you decide to come back. We're trying to replace false or harmful and even untrue ideas that we've been holding on to about God, about Jesus, about ourselves, about the world, about relationships, about all the important parts of our life, we have held on to some things for good reason. This is how life has kind of handed it to us or, or this is how, you know, the circumstances of our life. So we're holding on to something that makes sense. But if we're honest, it's not really working. And so what we're trying to do is, is replace some of those things with the thoughts and the perspectives that, that fill the mind of, uh, of Jesus. We're trying to think like Jesus. And, and for, for a lot of us, actually, to even... I, this whole idea of, um, uh, of being friends with Jesus or thinking like that, it's, it's uh, and I'm, I use this word paradigm shift. I, I was talking to a girl on our staff uh, or, uh, earlier or last week and, and she actually said, Jim, this, this is a paradigm shift. This is a, an aha moment. I have never thought about it like, like this. And I'm like, what, what are you talking about? He goes, I've never thought that Jesus wanted to be my friend. But, but now I'm trying to say, what if that's true, that, that God and I could live in a, in a friendship relationship. But then how do you become friends with God? How, how, do you be, how can you say, actually, Jesus is my friend? And, and here's what, I, I don't think we have to get too lofty with this. I think you just have to say, he, he's like every other relationship in my life. The way that I got to know my best friend, the way I got to know the person I'm married to or used to be married to or whatever that is, the person I say is the most important person in my life, the way that it happened is that we spent a lot of time together. We shared experiences together, good ones and bad ones, happy ones and sad ones. Some, some of those experiences turned out really great. Some of them fell apart at the end, but we were together with them. And, and the more experiences that we shared together, we, we got to know one another. And the, here's what I found is the more you get to know one another, like, like you begin to think like them. Like you have f people in your life, you're so close, you go like, before they even get the sentence finished, you finish it for them. Or, or there's thoughts that, that you just know what they're thinking without being told or even having to ask. You know what to do. Like I, when I go home later today, I know there's some stuff Robin wants to do. I don't have to ask. I, I know what she's thinking. We've spent 30, you know, four years together. 20 of the best years of my life, but 30, 34, you don't, she's not here. She was here last night. Don't, don't tweet her. All right, right, whatever. So, all right, so, so, so we, we get to know each other. And, and the Bible says that we can have that with Jesus. A guy named Paul wrote a big chunk of the Bible. He says, it's possible for ordinary people like us to actually have the mind of Christ. We can think like him. We can know where he's going. And before he even has to tell us what to do, I got it. I got it, Lord. I know what to do. And that's what I want to talk about today. 
Again, this is, a, this is different for me. I, I, see, I, I grew up in church, all right? My, I'm a pastor. My dad's a pastor. My grandpa's a pastor. So I drink water so much. And so anyway, <laughs> that's all you need to know. All right, but anyway, so I, here's how I've always thought about God. I think I speak for a lot of us that grew up in church, all right? <clears throat> God has always been like this boss or this master in the sky, and I'm at best an employee or a slave. And the way I've lived my Christian life is I'm just trying to not make him mad and not get in trouble in the end. I'm just trying to make it through the day. And, 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 and so, so that, that's, I'm just trying to like not mess it up. And that's the best I've ever hoped for with God. But what I'm, what the paradigm shift I'm having is that's not what I want. I actually want to think about Jesus as being my, my, my friend. And friends, at least the friends I have, we think alike. We have the same goals. We want the same wants. We, have, we, 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 we actually think, think a lot. A, a lot. And, and that takes time. All the people I call my closest friends, it's taken years for me to trust them and for them to, to, trust, to trust me. But we have to spend life together. Not, and with God, it's not just spiritual life. It's not just religious life. It's all of it. It's real life. And what I want to talk about today is, is real life. How does God fit into real life? Not church life, not religious life, the, the real life away from here, right? right? So again, let me, let me just kind of unpack some stuff and see if anybody can relate to this. So again, I grew up in church and anytime I heard someone like me stand on a stage like this and talk about the, this one word, I, I always just dumbed it down to this one thing. People like me stand up here and go and talk about this word called saved, You've been to church more than twice, you've heard about, are you saved? Have you been saved? When you were saved? And, and so my, whenever I heard my dad or somebody at, you know, at camp or whatever talk about, you know, are you saved? Or it's time to get saved or whatever that is. Here's, here's the only thing I thought about. There was a day in my life where I didn't buy into the whole thing, all right? And then a day happened in history where I said, I believe that what Jesus did on a cross, he's a perfect sacrifice and he can take away sin. I put my faith in what he did and it counted for me. And from that moment on, all my sins are forgiven. And after I die, I go to heaven instead of hell. I'm saved by grace through faith in what Jesus did on a cross. Now, let me just say this. I believe that. So don't email me going, so you're saying that's not important? Yes, it's so important. As a matter of fact, if that didn't happen, then anything else I say today is a moot point, all right? It's I'm, I'm saved by grace through faith in what Jesus did on a cross, period. Now here's the problem though, okay? At least with, with that version of that's all it is, all right? I, I got, I guess, saved, you know, early in life. I'll be honest with you, nothing changed. Nothing changed in my life. I went to church all through childhood and middle school and high school. I got baptized when I was eight. Listen, I, I, Christianity to me was I, after I die, I'm not going to hell. But the, the way I live my life, it never really changed much. The idea of my faith actually make a difference in what I did with my body. Or when I went on a date, what I did with, with her body. Or what I did with my, my, the words that came out of my mouth. Or, or what, what I put in my mouth. All that kind of stuff had little or no connection to what I claimed to believe to be true about Jesus. As a matter of fact, the first third of my Christian life, being saved just made me feel more guilty for what I kept on doing. As a matter of fact, I, I hated communion services. How about that from a pastor, all right? I mean, every time I took communion, I was like, oh, okay, once again, Jesus, all right? I'm sorry, and I'm ashamed, and I know you died on a cross for me, and the least I could do is not none of your business, all right, right? But, but I, I'll do better this, this week if you don't send me to hell. Boom. And then I go, and six days later, I do it again. Just rehashing more and more and more of the same stuff. If that's all that saved is, oh, okay, I think it's more than that. But it's, I gotta change my mind about it. See, what, I, I believe that when Jesus promised he would take away my sins when I put my faith in him, that's absolutely true. But what Jesus did on that cross, all right, it took away my sins, but by doing that, it removed an obstacle that made other things possible now, right? So until sin was removed, until Jesus goes, hey, Jim, just trust me, I can take sin and condemnation out of the way, and even when you mess up in the future, you don't have to worry about condemnation anymore. You can actually have something you weren't able to have before. I'm, I'm forgiven, and then this is what happened right after that. Jesus gave me access to having and living a new kind of life with God, right? It, it wasn't possible. This new kind of life was not possible as long as that my sin was on me. Jesus took it away, and now I have access to having and living a new kind of life with God starting now, from this moment on, not later after I die. Jesus prayed that for us on earth as it is in heaven. He wants it in my life now as it's going to be later when I'm with God. And I never thought about it like that. I, I never thought about, you know, God being involved in this life when I was in high school, when I was in college, when I was in my 20s. I worked for him, but he really wasn't involved in my life, at least in a difference-making way. 
Now, follow me as I unpack this, okay? Because I want, I want to unpack that phrase and, and see what that means for our life today. I, I want to give you some Bible verses. You can write them down. You can read them off the screen. You can get a Bible on your way home today. And they're pretty famous verses. But, but let me just kind of, kind of take you down a, a road to see if this makes sense. So probably one of the most famous verses in the whole Bible. If you've memorized a verse out of the Bible, this is probably the one, all right? And it's Jesus talking, and he says this. For God so loved the world... That God gave his only son, Jesus, that whoever, that's anyone who believes in Jesus and believes his faith has a little bit of confidence. How much does it take? I don't know. That's between you and God, all right? But whoever puts some confidence in Jesus, you will not perish, but you will have eternal life. And what we've been learning in here is eternal life is not what I grew up thinking. After I die, I go someplace else to be with God for eternity. It certainly includes that. But Jesus says eternal life is getting to know God and through Jesus now. Eternal life is knowing God now. All right, so that this, the first God, so I, God sent his son to me because he loves me. I put my faith in Jesus. I'm not gonna perish, I'm not going to hell. I have a, a, a different kind, a new, a new life. Everybody following me? Nod your head. Good, okay, good, sorry. So here's a, about seven chapters later, Jesus says this. He says, I am the door, and I'll, we'll unpack this in a second. I am the door, if anyone enters by me, and we'll talk about what we're entering into, he or she, you will be, and there's that word again, saved. And you'll go in and you'll go out and you'll find pasture. And the metaphor is like a sheep. Jesus says, I'm a door and the sheep can come in and out and be saved through me. The thief, not the shepherd, the thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. And this is Jesus still talking. He says, I came that they may have life and not just keep me alive another day. But Jesus, says, I came that you could have a quality of life that you can't have without me. I want you to have an abundant life. You following me? I want you to have an abundant life. Now, in the context of what Jesus is talking there, he's not talking about after your funeral. He's actually talking about, I want you to experience abundant life now. What do you mean? In this life. Which life? Your real life. So this is what we did all week long in our real life. So we got out of bed at some point in the day. It's vacation, no judgment, all right? So, so we got out of bed, and then we had breakfast maybe, and then we went to work, or we went to school, or we went to a ball field, or we went to the park, or we went to the grocery store, or we picked up kids, or we dropped off kids, or we, or we ran all, all over town, all right? Then we finally got home after work, and we ate some food, and then we hung out with some people that share our last name for a while, and then we went to bed. That's called real life. Did anybody do something like that this week, right? That's called your real life. And what Jesus is going, um, I, want, I want to be in that, I want to be a part of that. I want to do real life with you. From the time you get out of bed in the morning to the time you, you go to bed at, at night, right? And Jesus says, and the, the door I'm referring to is this. I can make it possible for you to take your get out of bed all the way to go back to bed, take all the parts of your life in between those two bookends and put them in the kingdom of God. I, you can take all your life and put it in here. And the kingdom of God is where what God do, once done is actually being done and you can live so close with God that what God wants done and you want done are the same things and you get out of bed in the morning and go let's do it because what, what, I want the same things you want so God let's get it done today t t together so file that away now getting Paul he says the same version of something it goes, like, it goes like this he says I have been crucified with Christ so when I put my faith in what Jesus did on a cross somehow I am just like with him we're, we're on the same team now it's no longer I who lives, not just me by myself, but Christ who lives in me. So, so Christ and I are going to go through life from this point on together. And this is important. And the life I now live in the, what's that word? Flesh, okay? This, this is where we're going to go today, all right? And the life I now live in the, my physical body, I live my life in my physical body, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Now, if you got lost in any of that, here's, here's everything I've said so far, right? Jesus died on a cross as a payment for sins. The moments I said, I want that to count for me, that's called faith, my sins are forgiven forever. They're not coming back. Now, at that point, look at this. At that point, I am then given a new life, a, a different kind of life. And this is really, really important because this is a paradigm shift for me, all right? I, I, I've always looked at anyone, can I have a second chance at, at this one? I don't want a second chance at this life. I don't, I don't want Jesus to look at me and go, let me tell you what my goal is for you, to be the best you ever. I don't want to be the best me ever. I, I don't want to be all that I, I can be. You know, I don't want a second chance at this life. I want a, a, a brand new one, a new life that makes a different way of living possible. Not in order to get God to love me or not in order to get God to save me, but because he already did, I want a new life. I want a new life. So this is what we're going to get Philosophical. Got supper, all right? This is so, don't go too deep, because I'm, I'm, I'm not deep. Some of you are looking at your neighbor going, he's not. He's really not deep. All right, so, so here's, here's some questions, all right? This is going to sound deep, but it's really not. So what's life? 
What, what is life? Uh, let, me, let me say it in, in, in a, uh, what I really mean, okay? Um, how do you know if something's dead or alive? Right? How, what's the difference between something going, it's alive and that's dead, okay? So, so if, you, if, if, if you drive home today and, and, and as you go down your street, there's a squirrel taking a nap or a cat taking a nap in the street, you can go, oh, that's a, that's, he's asleep. No, he's not. He's dead. How do you know? Okay, so here's, all right, because so if something's alive, it has the ability to interact with or influence or respond to the world around it. That little kitty cat's not going anywhere, okay? So the dumpster. It's a cat. Who cares? But anyway, but anyway. Uh, don't write, I don't care. Write me an email. I will laugh. All right, so there you go. I'm not a good person. I hate cats. All right, so, so life, I do. Pray for me if you want. I, I need it in so many areas. But anyway, um, so life is the ability to, to, to respond and interact and influence. And you have been given life, all right? So which means what? You've been given a new chance to respond and interact and influence God and the people around you and the world that you live in. Jesus, I want to give you, a, I want to give you a, new, a new life. I want to give you a life that's abundant. Another place it says, I want to give you a life that's truly life as opposed to the life you've settled for and put a white flag and went, that's all it is. So you have a new life through Jesus if you want it. So let's keep going with the philosophy, okay? So, so, so if you've been given a life, what do you do with your life? What do you do with life? Ready? You live it. See, I studied for you, right? right. I, I, live your life. That should be on a t-shirt. Live, live your life. And where do you live out your life? This isn't hard. Where did you live your life this week? In your body, right? In your body. And what do you do with your body? Let me answer it. Don't answer it out loud, okay? What do you do with your body? Everything. Everything you did this week was your body. Everything you looked at, everything you tasted, everything you touched, everything you acted, everything you said, it came through, you, through your body. Whatever you do spiritually, physically, relationally, mentally, socially, occupationally, creatively, everything you do came through your body and nothing you did this week did not involve your body or your brain or your speech or your eyes or your touch, all right? Did anybody do something without their body? No, I, 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 everything I did, it was this, all right, right, right. So that's very, very important. Everything you do, your new life is lived out through your body. Now, remember this from a few weeks ago? We're going somewhere with this, so hang on, right? You are a spiritual being, and you knew that. With unbodily, I mean, you can't cut it open and find your spirit, but you know it's there. You're a spiritual being with unbodily, personal, it's uniquely yours, it's powerful, it gets stuff done that is expressed by your free will. This is the part that makes you most like God. You get to ch choose your life. Your free will through the choices that you make in your real everyday life. And don't read the last line because up to this point, we've put a period right there until this week. But where do you live out your real everyday life that's express, expressing your free will because you're a spiritual being? And the answer is, I do it all in my body. In my body. Now, now here's the question I'm gonna look at today. What, where does your body, where, this past week anyway, where, where does your body spend most of its time during your everyday life? What, what was your body doing most of the week? And here's the answer. My body was with my family, and it wasn't my family. My body was at work, and when it wasn't with my family and at work, I was goofing off after work. I was playing ball, or I was, you know, going bowling, or I was meeting friends at a club, whatever that is, all right? I, that, that, that was, I was entertaining myself. And how, how about this? When I, wasn't with my, when I wasn't with Robin, or my kids, or my grandkids this week, uh, when I wasn't at work, all right, and when I wasn't at the gym, or out in the mountains, or something like that, um, I was thinking about it, right? Isn't that your whole life? I'm either with my, my family, I'm at work, or I'm goofing off. And when I'm not doing that, like when I'm going to sleep at night, I'm thinking about those three areas of, uh, of my life. Now, here's where I'm going with this. Here's what I think I missed, and here's what I think the church has missed for like the last 2,000 years. But, but we've got to rethink some stuff, right? Jesus never reduced being saved and living your life in the kingdom. Or he never reduced that down to showing up at a religious building a, a couple hours a week. He never said the Christian life is, can you read your Bible four or five times if you have time? And maybe could you carve out some quiet time in the morning if you're not running late? He never said that the whole Christian life is reduced to going to camp or Bible studies or, or, or goosebump, you know, spiritual moments in your life. And there's nothing wrong with all those things. I, I want all those things in my life. If, if anything, the value of those things is pointing to something greater. And here's what all those moments in our life that, that, that we feel God's presence are actually pointing to. It's the reality that goes like this. And this is, this is how we gotta start thinking from now on. There's not, you don't have a spiritual life and a secular life. And spiritual means it has to do with God. And secular is, no, that doesn't have anything to do with God. That's just, I gotta get stuff done. You don't have a spiritual life and a secular life. There's not, how about this? There's not a spiritual life and then I do stuff with my body. 
but they don't have anything to do with each other. Not true. There's not, a, there's not a spiritual life, and then I got my job, and I work nine to five, and at five I pick Jesus back up and we drive home together, but, but I'm at work, it's just, it's just different. No, it's not. There's not, it's really get personal, right? There's not, you know, your life with Jesus and your sex life, and go, well, they don't have anything to do with each other. Oh, read your Bible. They have everything. God intended going, your spiritual life and your sex life are intimately intertwined. There's not, how about this? This is really offensive. You can't say, I got a spiritual life with God, and then I got my money. They don't have anything to do with each other. Yes, they do. There's, there's not a spiritual life. And please stop saying this to me whenever you're talking to me in the lobby. And, uh, well, Jim, out there in the real world, life. Ah. No, there's not a spiritual life and a real world life. You know what there is? There's just life. There's just, you know, and you only get one of them. And when you put your real life, the time you get out of bed in the morning, the time you go to, to bed at night, if you put all that into God's kingdom, it's all spiritual. Everything we do is spiritual because wherever your body goes, take, you take your spirit with you and your spirit is telling your body what it's gonna do all day long. And the big decision you make all day long without even thinking about it is, am I gonna include God in what I'm doing with my body or am I gonna exclude or try to pretend like I'm excluding God from what I'm doing with my body? But in the kingdom of God, everything's spiritual. I never thought about it like that. I go to church and then I live my life. I, I, I'd read my Bible and then I'd live my life and the two didn't meet. I'm, I'm going to give you one Dallas Willard quote because I'm trying to wean you off of, I, I'm not. You need to hear Dallas Willard more. All right? so, so look at this. This is so good. I wish I'd thought this up. He said this. He said, the greatest issue facing the world today with all its heartbreaking needs, the biggest, the world is screaming for something to help, all right? But the greatest issue is this, whether those who by profession or culture are identified as Christians. So the world is in a mess and it's waiting on Christians to decide if they, they will or they will not become disciples. Not just go to church, not just sing songs, not just memorize Bible verses, but become disciples. What do you mean? Students or apprentices or practitioners of Jesus Christ, steadily learning from him how to bring, to live the life of the kingdom of the heavens. The world's waiting on this. How to bring the whole life of the kingdom of the heavens into every corner of human existence. The world is a mess. It's waiting for Christians to decide if I'm gonna follow Jesus and bring his presence into every corner of human existence. And every corner of human existence includes every minute and every place that your body goes. You have been given a new life. And that new kingdom life will be lived out wherever your body is through how you choose to live your life, interacting with or, or responding to God and other people around you. And you know what? Most of your life, at least your awake hours of your life, and what you choose to do your body, you know where you're gonna live it out at? Family with those people that share your DNA, your address, or your last name. You're gonna spend most of your waking hours with them, and when you're not with them, you're at work, do, earning a paycheck to pay, to pay the bills. And if you're not with your family, and you're not at work, then you're goofing off after work, doing whatever you like to do, sports, arts, nature, playing in the mountains. I, I don't know what that is for you. And, and most of that, think about this, most of your awake hours are doing the same thing over and over and over and over, day after day after day. And you look at it and go, it's just life. It's just mundane. And here's what I mean by mundane, all right? Mundane is this. If you Google it, this is the dictionary version of it, all right? Mundane actually translates earthly. It's not spiritual. It's just got to get stuff done. It's repetitive. I did it 10 times yesterday. I'm going to do it 10 times today. Tomorrow, I'll probably do it 10 more times. I do it every day, day to day. It's not very exciting. It's not remarkable. It doesn't blow anybody's mind. I just do it. It's very, very, very common. And on its own, all the parts of your life that you're thinking about right now going, that's, that's my life. I did that eight hours yesterday. I'm going to do it 10 hours tomorrow. It, says, it's, 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 it can be mundane unless you have a paradigm shift and change the way you think. Because if Jesus came to give us an abundant life, then that has to include all the parts of your life that you would go, not important, repetitive, mundane, from every corner of human existence. And, and what Jesus is teaching is you can take all the things you're thinking about right now, going, it just eats up the day. I do it eight hours, 10 hours, every day, day after day. Jesus says you can take all those parts of your life and put them in the kingdom. And those things that you just look at going, it's not important, can actually be described with words like life-giving and joyful and satisfying and significant. And all the parts of human existence have to include the parts of your life going, well, that doesn't count, does it? Absolutely. So the way we take notes here at Flatirons is with our cameras uh, because this, this is a screensaver shot. It's so good. All right, so look at this. Think about this. Nothing is mundane 
if it's lived out in the kingdom of God because what God wants done can be done there too. Think about that. Nothing has to be mundane. Nothing has to be like blah. Nothing has to, do, has to be like common. Nothing has to be unimportant anymore because if you take that and put it in the kingdom of God, God says, I wanna do something there too. Now, that's the first thing. So file that away. Here's the other thing I think I want us to think about today, all right? I think Christians, I think we have to start asking better questions about God and about life, all right? So I'll, I'll give you an example of that. So um, some of you weren't even born, but you probably heard of this. But about 20 or 30 years ago, there was a Christian slogan that swept the world and everybody went out and bought a bracelet that had four letters on it, remember? Even if you weren't born then, you've heard about it, okay? Because your grandma had one, all right? But it was the WWJD, which stood for, what would Jesus do? And it's not a bad question, Right? And the whole thing is like, if you find yourself in a really tough spot and you don't know what to do, ask yourself, what would Jesus do? And then do that. Okay? It's not a bad question, but here's why I don't think it's the best question. All right? And I had one and I had the t-shirt. I'm sorry. All right? So what, what would Jesus do? I don't know. Like, I remember six years ago, I, I flew to Louisville and I was at the VA hospital with my dad and his last couple days of cancer. What would Jesus do if he went and visited my dad? Ready? Cure cancer. I don't know how to do that. Right, I went to South Sudan in February. I walked into a village and like half the people were starving to death. What would Jesus do? I don't know. I read about this story in the Bible. He took some fish and some loaves and prayed over them and fed like 5,000 people. Does anybody know how to do that? Because I would have done that on the spot, right? If you're out fishing, you know, this summer or something like that and a storm hits your boat and it starts to sink, what would Jesus do? Walk on water. How cool would that be? I don't know how. What would Jesus do? I don't know. Raise people from the dead. I would love to do that. I'm not him. So here, here's, here's a, what I think is a better question. It's a much longer bracelet, but whatever, okay? How about this, all right? <laughs> what would Jesus do if he was me? I know what I would do if I was him. I'd cure cancer and I'd feed the world and I'd raise people from the dead all day long. It would be so much fun, all right? But I'm not him. What would Jesus do if he was me? What would Jesus do if he had my situation? And here's what we think. Well, Jesus would never put himself in that situation. Well, I did and here I am. So what would Jesus do now that I'm stuck here? Right? I think it's a good question. What would Jesus do if he had my life? I know what I would do if I had somebody else's life, but I don't. What would Jesus do if he had my life? What would Jesus do? How would he treat Robin if he was married to Robin? If he, if he had my money or lack of money or my bills or my debt? If Jesus had my kids and I, I, I'm, I'm Jesus and I'm these kids' dad, what would I do with these kids? If Jesus had my body, if Jesus had two deals on the table, well, Jesus wouldn't have those deals. Well, I do. And these are my two options. So what would Jesus do if these were his two options? See, if, if God's goal for my life is to form me spiritually into the same kind of person that Jesus is, so in this life, right, what would come out of me if Jesus had my life? If somebody did that to me and I'm trying to be like Jesus, what would Jesus do if he had that happen to him? All right, how would I redeem the 50 to 70% of my waking hours that is consumed by mundane, unimportant, non-religious activities? Let's be honest. Most of us did not spend eight hours a day this week reading our Bibles. I didn't, and you pay me to, all right? I, I, I just didn't do that. You know, I, I just sat around and listened to worship music all day long, and I taught Bible studies to my kids and all the kids in the neighborhood. No, no, you didn't. You know what you did all week? You sat at a desk or you stood in an assembly line, or you tried to sell cars or insurance or whatever that, what that is, all right? You, you hung out with your friends after work. You went to happy hour, whatever that is. Like, like, but if, if, if Jesus had my life after he got off work, before he went to bed, how would he redeem that time with his kids? What would he do? Because I gotta figure out what to do. These are my kids. See, if everything is spiritual, how do I intentionally bring Jesus into the mundane areas of my life that we continually write off as, it's not important, and I don't, think, I don't think that we can continue for the church to be effective anyway for us to say, being a Christian is I go to a religious building one hour or two hours a week. I read my Bible a couple times a week if I can find it. And I have quiet time if I, if I remember it. If that's, if that's your Christian life, is it any wonder why you look at most of your awake hours and, and you never describe them as joyful or significant? Most of, most of your life drains the life out of you. It's, it's not life giving. So my question is this, if Jesus is who he says he is and will keep his promises, is it possible to take the mundane hours of our day and put them inside the kingdom and see, see them become something more? There was a time when, you know, I, I went to college. I have a degree. I have a profession, like a dental hygienist. Like I, I have this degree in this life and then had kids. 
it's easy to start to feel like claustrophobic, like I can't take this anymore, I'm gonna explode. These are the like the things I start to tell myself, like I, this isn't important enough. Like I used to do something important, this isn't important. Um, I used to have a job and I could contribute, now I just like take care of kids all day, like what is the point? <laughs> So the way that I think I've approached my spiritual life so far is it's separate. Like I have a spiritual life and then I have mom life or wife life or whatever that might be. And most of my relationship with Jesus has been like peaks and valleys. Like I I relate to him when things are going really well, I can, you know, thank him and and then when things are really bad, I can, you know, cry out to him like, "Where are you?" But it's this middle middle ground. How does Jesus tie into, you know, when I'm doing dishes or when I'm playing with my kids or disciplining my kids or going to the grocery store? Like, where is Jesus? How does Jesus fit into that? I think specifically um, in motherhood, it's really easy to feel like you're alone. My kids become almost an inconvenience or like a hurdle I have to get past. Like once I get past this phase or get past this part of my life, then I can have a relationship with Jesus again. Like we hear about Jesus wanting this abundant life for us and um, you know, we have the Holy Spirit living inside of us. And I feel like I just kind of, I came to this realization, like why does my life not feel abundant? What would it look like if I, if I actually believed that Jesus was with me and could help me mother or be a wife, like be a better wife, be a better mom. What would happen if I actually like leaned into that? So I started doing a Bible study just about being a mom and what that look, what does God have in mind for moms? And I just kind of kept coming back to this idea that um, yes, my day is mundane, like most of motherhood is just mundane, but how can I reach my kids in this mundane season and not hold that off for later. And in trying to teach my kids about Jesus, I feel like Jesus kept revealing himself to me. Um, so part of that Bible study in Deuteronomy, it's the verse where it talks about teaching your kids the commandments of God. And it specifically says to do this as you walk along the road, as you lie down, as you get up. These aren't huge life events. It's just the day to day stuff that we have to do and how how we can tie Jesus into those things. Like how would Jesus parent? Like how would Jesus have the attitude of, you know, being patient and gracious and sacrificial constantly all day long? Like that's what I started to try and live out, not viewing my kids as like this inconvenient this inconvenience, but more like this is my purpose. And it's crazy to think that He lets us in on this. Like He lets us point His kids back to Him. Like that I can play a part in that is just, it blows my mind. It's, it's the opposite of mundane. It's so life-giving and so, th there's so much purpose in that, that God lets me partner with Him. Um, and it just makes every moment of the day feel that much bigger. It doesn't feel like this small, like I'm in these four walls all day feeling claustrophobic. Now it's like, no, I get to like partner with God and point His kids back to Him. That just is crazy to me. There's a, there's a couple of things. Go ahead and clap. It's all right. Several things I like about that video. One is I'm actually convicted that my grandkids are cuter than yours. Uh, that's one thing. Especially when Mike, Mike kept taking his pants off. He gets that from Ben. Um, <laughs> no, um, I'm so proud of Allie. Um, there, there are a few, few things in that video I really love. One is what she said. She said, I had to think about stuff differently. I have to think, I have to look at it different. And this is what we've been talking about in all the areas of our life, all right? And that Jesus used the word repent. I mean, if Jesus really is here with us, moms, stuck in those four walls going crazy or, or what, just apply to any area of life, stuck in this job, stuck in this situation in my life going, this is just wasted time, all right? Then, then, then if Jesus is right here in this with us, then what, what appear to be unimportant or wasted actually might have a purpose, I gotta rethink how I think about that. The second thing that, that Ali said in that video was this, I had to get intentional. 
She had to intentionally look for opportunities to use or leverage what usually is just a passing moment. You just go on to the next moment and go, time out. I need to recognize that, that Jesus might want to do something with me and my kids. All right? So like, like I, was talk, I was talking to Allie. Um, she, she says, you know, right, right before this video was shot, she says, we did something really important today. We went to uh, Target. That's, and that's like loading three kids up in the, in the, moms, you all understand. Sometimes you take your kids to Target. It's like, I want to get them home or, or I'm going to kill them in public. And I got to get them home first. And so that's a joke. Don't write me emails. All right. So my, my, my point is, is that she, she says, I, I want to leverage my time better. And so they're driving home from Target and she's just worn out. And Emery, a uh, four-year-old, she, she says, hey, mom, look, that cloud looks like a hand. And I, and I was like, yeah, it's a hand. She goes, why is it a hand? Why does it look like a hand? And Allie didn't have the atmospheric conditions that make clouds form into hands. And so she said this, um, I just think God's creative and he wanted to make you smile. And see, she went, so maybe that's Jesus's hand. And Allie says, maybe it is. See, in kids ministry right now, our kids are learning about the miracles of Jesus. You know what Emery said to, to Allie? Jesus's hands are powerful, mom. He can do amazing things. And Allie felt like the best mom ever, <laughs> right? Because she just redeemed re one time. She didn't read in the Bible going, well, the clouds were formed by the creation of the earth. And by, she didn't read a Bible study with him, stuff like that. She says, I think God's creative and he, and he just wants to make you smile today. You gotta think of it different in all the areas of your life. So, so how about this, parents, all right? A, a spilled glass of juice for the 47th time today and you're, and you're sweeping up those dang goldfish one more time before you blow up at your kids. Why don't you take a time out and go, how patient God must be with me? Because I have crapped all over his floor so many times and he keeps cleaning up my messes. How about a timeout going, hey, this is, what, this is what Allie said. She says, I'm partnering with God and I'm trying to teach my kids about Jesus and God is teaching me about himself through my kids. We just gotta, we gotta think different. We just got to look at it different. So in Deuteronomy, uh, the, the Bible study was talking about, Moses gets all these people together and he says, I want to talk to parents real quick. I, you're not allowed to put God in a box on a Sabbath. And that's the last time you talk to him. It's all week long. This is, this is what Moses says. He says, hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your body, all your might, and all your strength. And later Jesus adds in, and you shall love him with all of your mind, all your thoughts. You got to change the way you think. He, Moses says, and these words that I command you today shall be on your heart. You shall teach them, what's that word? Diligently, that means on purpose. You're gonna have to look for opportunities, intentionally do it because otherwise it just slips through your fingers and you have to like, I gotta think different and I gotta look before I just blow up or I just rush on. I wanna take a time out and go, hey, Jesus, you wanna do something there? Because I wanna do it with you. You're gonna teach them diligently to your children. When should you do that? You should talk about them when you sit in your house. What do you mean? It means you're at dinner tonight and you go, nobody's getting up ever, until you finish your hamburger helper. Why not? Because Jesus wants you to eat hamburger helper. Already. I don't know what you do. You somehow bring Jesus into that conversation. Hamburger helper may not have been the best example, but whatever, right? And, and when you walk by the, when you, you know, walk away to walk to the ball field with your kids, or when you walk home after, after the loss, when you just walk around the street or go to the park, when you lie down and tuck your kids in at night, you're just gonna bring Jesus into the tucking in at night. And, and when you get up in the morning, you're gonna somehow figure a way to bring Jesus into that. You gotta do it on purpose. Otherwise, they're gonna be gone. Right? And all of us whose kids aren't home anymore, it's, it's five minutes from now. And we're letting moments slip through our fingers and we've got to intentionally go, hey, time out. Hey, let's pay attention to that right now. We've got to change our mind. We've got to be intentional. Parents, we have to. Otherwise, it's just mundane, right? Let me give you one more area and that's your job, all right? If you're not with your family, you're spending most of your time with, you know, at, at work trying to make money to pay for your family, all right? And so, so if Jesus is your life and you're going to take all the parts of your life and put them inside the kingdom of God, we can no longer say this. Faith is personal. Business is business. Mm-mm. Not in the kingdom of God. In the kingdom of God, faith permeates everything. Let me give you one more Bible verse. So Paul, Paul writes this to some people just like us. And he's trying to say, see, as you live your life, all the parts of your life, when you go to work, when you go to the, you know, whatever, after work with your friends, whatever that is, he says, whatever you do and everything you do, do in, in word or deed, everything, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus. And anytime you see in the Bible, in the name of Jesus, or when you pray in Jesus' name, stuff like that, you can actually translate it in the reality that Jesus is right here and makes it possible. 
It really translates that way. When you get baptized, a lot of us, we, we, we had this whispered in our ear, I baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. What you're saying is, I am joining you right now in the reality that your life is surrounded by all the Trinity from this point on. You're living in community with God. Does that make sense? So whatever you do, you're gonna do it in the reality that Lord Jesus is gonna do it with you, giving thanks to God the Father through him. So what, what does that mean? I'm gonna do everything in the reality of Jesus. Let me tell you what it doesn't mean. It does not mean that you are now the appointed Holy Spirit of your office or your neighborhood, or your HOA, or your ball team, or whatever that is. It means that you, you're now, now that you're a Christian, you are now known as the nagging residence. The giant party pooper, the big Bible tucked under your arm. When you walk down the hallway of your office, everybody runs for cover, going, oh no, she's gonna kill everything. You know who you are, right, right? See, see I, don't be, a, if you're a Christian, let me give, this is off the record, don't tell anybody, right? If you're a Christian, um, stop being a party killer. You should party more. You know how I can prove that? It's in the Bible. What do you mean? Almost every great thing Jesus did was at a party. Think about it. Prove me wrong. Read your Bible, right? Like he was at a party one time. Go, oh, you're out of wine? I got it. Poof, water into wine. I'd party with Jesus. That's all I'm saying. <laughs> I don't know why we have to be these depressing. That you can't do that. You can't do that. You can't do that. You can't do that. Well, that's not our job. What is our job? Well, whatever our job is. How about this? Learning to do your job in the same way Jesus would do your job if he had your job. Well, Jesus wouldn't have my job. Then maybe you shouldn't either. Maybe you should get a new job, all right? So, but whatever that is, is that, you know, you say, well, I, I want to get a different job later, and then when I get this other job that I really is my dream job, then I'll do it the way Jesus is. You don't have that job. You have this one. Well, I hate it. I don't, I'm sorry. This is your job right now. And so if Jesus had this job that you hate, but he's stuck in it right now, maybe you'll get a better one later, but you're stuck in this one right now, how would Jesus do your job? Do it that way. If, if, if Jesus was the boss, if Jesus was, if some of you, you own companies and you have employees and stuff like that, the answer to you, if Jesus ran your company, how would he run your count, company? And here's what a lot of business owners are going right now. Well, it would fail because he'd probably be passive or weak and he wouldn't collect the bills and he would give everybody a break and he'd lose profit all the time. And not Jesus, you haven't read your Bible. I, I would love for Jesus, I was gonna say Jesus to be my boss, he kind of is, I just thought of that. Uh, <laughs> I just thought of that. I'm just, it was late. All right. So this is what, if you read about Jesus and what he says about running your business, this is what he says. Jesus told his followers to operate all the parts of their life that has to include your businesses. Run your business as wise as a snake and as innocent as a dove. Right? Make money and do it honestly. And be fair. See, that, that's what he said. I'm going to make a statement. It's not a true statement, but it ought to be. Curious? How about this? I believe this. Christians should be the most sought after business leaders and most sought after employees because their product and their service and their reputation in the business community is a reflection of the excellence and attitude of Jesus Christ himself. That's how it ought to be. We should be the best bosses. We should be the best workers, the best employees because how we do our job, we're actually saying this is what Jesus, this is how he would do it. Now I'll be honest with you, we're not that. Just because you slap a fish on your business card or on your van and say, I'm a Christian, you should do your business with me. No, you know why? You're, you're, you're horrible at your job. Your shoddy workmanship, shoddy, I said shoddy, all right, all right, you show up late, you don't do what you say you were gonna do and you overcharge. No, I don't care if you're Christian or not. Christians should be the people we want to be as our bosses. Christians are the people we say, we, I want Christians as my employees because they work better than anybody else. It's like they're trying to reflect Jesus. They wash... Dishes at Denny's, but they would do it as excellent as Jesus would. They, they run a business. They run a bank. They, they run finances. They, they, they run a, a sports team. They do it in the way that's as excellent as Jesus himself would have done it. See, that's, amen, anybody? That baby just said amen, right? All right, so, so let me, uh, so let me let's answer some of the questions you have in your head right now. Because some of you are saying right now, that wouldn't work in my line of work. That wouldn't work in my situation. Well, I'm going to look at that, Okay. So we're going to spend uh, the whole fall looking at this thing called the Sermon on the Mount. In the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus spends a whole bunch of time differentiating between what a person who lives their life in the kingdom, how they, they live their life, what they do and don't do, and then what a person who says, I don't put that part of my life in the kingdom, I, I, it's mine, I, I do it. And the big difference, if you read this, between a person who lives their life in the kingdom and outside the kingdom comes down to one word, it's in there like six times, and that word is worry. The biggest difference between somebody in the kingdom and outside the kingdom is worry. And here's what I mean by worry. Worry is best summed up as the things that you aren't trusting God to do or provide for you, so you gotta figure it out on your own. The things that you're worried about in your life are the things you're going, I don't know what God's gonna do about that, so I'll do it. 
and it stresses you out. If you wanna know yeah, what, what, what you have and haven't surrendered to God, let me just say this. We sing songs in here all the time about God that aren't true. And here's what I mean by that. I surrender all. No, we don't. I surrender some, partially, but not all. You know, you know what, I can tell you, you know what you have not surrendered to God? The thing you worry about all day. Because you're not sure God's gonna take care of it, so you've got to, and it's stressing you out. And you know what's at the top of your list of things you worry about? The big three, family, marriage, kids, parents, job, career, money, and trying to figure out how you're gonna pay for everything, how you're gonna entertain, and how you're gonna get to sports leagues, and how you're gonna pay for vacation, and how you're gonna do all this other stuff. So listen to what Jesus teaches about a person who says, I'm gonna take all of that, call my real life and put it inside the kingdom of God. He says this, so don't worry. If I really am who I say I am and I can keep my promises, don't worry, saying, what shall we eat or what shall we drink or what shall we wear? And you know what that's called? Mundane, but important. He's not saying it's not important. Does anybody say I'm gonna give up eating or drinking or I'm okay with you know, being naked outside? Unless you live in Boulder, it's whatever, all right? But <laughs> no, this is important stuff, but don't worry about it, okay? Why not? Because the pagans run after all this stuff. And pagans, Jesus is saying, people that have no confidence in God whatsoever is gonna take care of them, so they run after these things and they worry all the time. But here's why we don't worry. Your heavenly Father knows, knows what you need. Go back a slide. You jumped on me. You jumped on me, space world. There we go. All right, so, so the pagans, they don't have any faith at all. They run after these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you what? He knows you need to eat and, and have a job and sleep indoors and stuff like that. He knows, what, he knows that you need them. So what should we do instead, Jesus? How about this, all right? How about seek first his kingdom and his righteousness? He's not saying don't seek what shall we eat or what shall we drink or what shall we wear. You gotta have those things. It's a priority thing. Seek first his kingdom and his righteousness and all these things, what? That, on that list back there, they will be given to you as well. Therefore, don't worry about tomorrow. This is like a country song right here. Don't worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. Isn't that true? That's just true. Now, you gotta catch what Jesus is saying. He's not saying, ah, oh, don't worry, be happy. He's not saying that. Don't worry, it'll all work out, you know? No, there's, there's, listen, if you're gonna try to live life on your own outside the kingdom, you ought to worry a lot because you're on your own. What Jesus is saying is this, don't worry, why not? Because your heavenly father knows what you need and he wants to do life with you. And if that's true, it's going to be all right. See, Jesus loves country music. It's right there, right? I mean, if, you're, if God is on it and he goes, I want to do that part of life with you, it's going to be fine. And maybe that's why God brought you in here today. It's going to be all right. Just take that part and put it like, I'm going to try to do that with, with God. Now, we're going to have a training, all right? So all, week, all series long, I've been giving you this training to go home and train. And I used to call it application, but now I'm not calling it that anymore. I'm calling it training. You know why? Because training fits. Here's what I mean by that. You're going to be out here in three minutes. We're going to sing a song because you whined the last couple weeks. All right, so, all right, so. Most people I know, most Christians I know who say, I need that part of my life to change. I want God to change that part of my life. I keep messing up in this part of my life and I just need God to fix that part of my life. Here's what we're really asking. We wanna keep on doing what we've been doing all along, but the next time we get in a big crisis, we want God to ride in on a white horse, wave his magic Jesus one and zap us and then we do the right thing out of nowhere. It's, it doesn't happen like that. It's never gonna happen like that. If you think that you're gonna keep on living your life and then that's gonna happen again in your life but you're gonna act different, you're, you're fooling yourself. So what's the answer? You gotta train for it. Let me give an example of that. So a couple of weeks ago, Rob and I were laying in bed and we're watching a Rockies game on TV because it's awesome. All right, so, so we're watching a Rockies game. It's about, about halfway about to fourth, fifth inning, all right? And, and the score's really, really tight. This is what happens. Nolan Arenado's on third base, all right? And the batter, I don't remember who the batter is, he line drives it. The, the, the announcer said it came off the bat at 105 miles an hour. It takes one hop and goes high. Arenado jumps up in the air like inhumanly high, snags the ball. Before he lands, he grabs the ball out of his mitt and then sidearms it from third base all the way to first base and throws the guy out. And Rob and I are like, that was amazing. And, and, and what was amazing about it is not just the throw, is that he was effortless. He made it look like easy, like, yeah, just did that. If I did that, I mean, I'd, I'd need a drink and a paramedic. I mean, I, I'm like, what happened to my arm? But he just, he just he made it look easy. And we're like, how did he do that? Here's the answer. He did it a thousand times in practice when there was nobody in the stands, when there was no camera, when there was no cheering crowd, when there was no announcer saying, did you all see that? He did it a thousand times. And you know why? Because when a ball comes off the bat at 105 miles an hour, you don't have to, time to think, what should I do now? What would Jesus do? I don't know. You know what happens? 
<laughs> your, your, your mitt just goes muscle memory and it goes to the right position and then you throw the ball because you've been training for it. It's the same way with Jesus. Listen, a lot of us keep getting slaughtered by life because it comes at us 105 miles an hour and we go, what should I? Boom, and we're done. And the only hope, the only hope that that's not gonna take us out again and again and again is we start training, okay? I gotta think like Jesus today and then tomorrow and the next day and the next day and the next day and the next day. And then that thing that finally takes you, has been taking you out, all of a sudden it's gonna come at you 105 miles an hour. You know what? You're gonna be all right. Because you're gonna know what to do. You're just gonna do what you do because of who you are. Does that make sense? So here's your training, right? So what is one attribute of Christ? I'm gonna give you two things. What is one attribute of Christ that needs to grow in your life? And you don't have to pray a lot about that, you know, all right? So what's one part of Christ that needs to grow in your life that you could bring into the three main areas of your life this week? What's your family waiting on for you to bring to them? It's like Christ. What, 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 what job? And at students, I would say this. It's school for you, but, but whatever you're filling the school hours with you know, during the summer, right? But what, what, what is, what is the, the, the people at your work, whether you're at the top of the food chain or at the bottom, whatever that is, what are the people around you waiting on for you to bring to them in the name of Christ, in the reality of Jesus? And then you're going to play ball later today. You're going to go to the movies today. You're going to go hiking today. What, what could you think about differently that you could bring to whatever God brings in front of you between now and bedtime tonight? And then do that tomorrow and tomorrow and the next day, okay? So, so, here's a, so take a picture of that. That's your assignment. Just leave that up. Here, here's the other thing is, so, the, the, um, so our, the, the people in our like, production area, they're trying to get me to use social media. I hate it because it's of the devil, but I'm trying to tweet, all right? I'm trying to, and so here's my, this is my, ready for this? My handle. It's my Twitter handle, right? So take a picture of that, right? And here's why. It's like, so I started this morning and for the next week, I'm gonna get on there and for a minute or two, I'm gonna, I'm gonna put a little video on there. I did it this morning, a thousand people already watched it, right? So, so um, I'm gonna put a little thing going, hey, Flatirons, let's do this, this today. All of us. So there's like 15, 20,000 of us listening to my voice right now across campuses. And then uh, over the next week, another 100,000 people are gonna watch across the world, right? So how about this? Everybody gets on there and goes, okay, Here's what we're gonna do today. We're gonna go to the ball field, we're gonna go to work, we're gonna go to the pool, we're gonna go to the park, we're gonna, we're gonna, we're gonna go home tonight, we're gonna have dinner. What's one thing that my family is waiting on for me to bring from Christ to them? And then let's do that today. And then tomorrow let's do it again. And the next day, the next, and if we do like a thousand days in a row, you know what happens? We don't get taken out again because of who we've become. Does that make sense? So just try it with me. And if nobody gets on my Twitter, I'll shut it down. Which I'd really like to do. All right, so anyway. So anyway, let's stand out all our campuses. Let's stand up together. I'm gonna pray. We're gonna sing a song and then uh, we're gonna go into training mode. All right, so that we can actually start thinking like Jesus because the people in our life that God has placed in our life have been waiting for this their entire lives. Make sense? So God, right now, you know, we're, I, I'm gonna pray some very specific things. God, I pray that, 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 that my daughter Allie's video spoke to some mom or single parent, mom or dad out there who feels like I am dying here and nobody cares and I am alone in my parenting. God, I pray right now you would whisper to their heart, I'm with you. And what you're doing is the most important thing that you could ever do and what I ever want for those kids that I've entrusted to you. Mom, you're so important and Jesus cares and he wants to be in those four walls. You're gonna be all right. God, I, I pray for the person that's stuck in a job right now going, this is worthless and meaningless, but maybe someday I'll actually have a meaningful life. Well, I pray that for them too, God, but right now they're stuck in this job. And so will you jump in? Will, they, you, will you just say, speak to their heart right now and have them invite you into this job that they hate because they're there for a reason right now and you wanna do it with them. I pray for the parent who doesn't know what to do with their kid. The kid doesn't know what to do with their parent. I pray that somehow you would just do something in us right now that we start to think like you day after day after day after day, and so that the thing that has taken us out at the knees so many times doesn't stand a chance, and we actually can say, I'm gonna be all right because I'm not alone. I'm with God. He's right here with me, and I'm in his kingdom, and that changes everything. I pray all this in the name and the reality of Jesus. Amen.